who was the biggest winner of free agency that and more this week on the couch joined by fellow yinzer matt williamson when i say who was the biggest winner of free agency take this any direction you want who was the biggest winner in the last week so many directions to go i mean i, I think atlanta is now a legit contender in their division I, I, you know, speaking of that division, I like the Tampa brought back their own. I, I think Chicago's doing a lot of good things to, you know, build a nest for Caleb Williams. That's a term I use yeah. for like incoming quarterbacks. Nice soft landing spot for him right now. Keenan Allen's a great nest builder. I'm going with Houston, though. I mean, I really like what Houston did, particularly in their front seven. You know, you add Daniel Hunter, uh, El Shahir has that, that Niners ties. Even Danico Autry, you know, keeping guys like Noah Brown and Dalton Schultz. Joe Mixon doesn't really move the needle for me, but he's a legit player. Throw a Cuda on the other side of Stingley. So I think this is an up-and-coming team. It's obvious to me teams, you know, players want to play for Houston, and it was there was a barren wasteland for so long before this, you know, before the Stroud era. So I think it's really exciting that this team has truly turned the corner and is on the rise. Yeah, I like I like the the teams you mentioned too because I really like free agency and the draft because teams can't lie. Their actions right. speak about where they think they are in their organizational arc. Uh when we have new regimes, we see what the focus is. And just the 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 teams you mentioned right off the bat, Tampa is keeping the band together. And they did, uh, Matt, I described it like one of those logic problems. You need to get like the grain, the sheep and the wolf all across the river in your canoe. <laughs> right, like right. They needed to get Baker and Mike Evans and Antoine Winfield. Uh, and, and they needed to get them all to 2024. And then they pulled that off. And, and why not? Um, and Atlanta, you can see that very clear focus that they feel like everything is in place except the quarterback. Uh, I do like Darnell Mooney, though. I think the Darnell mm -hmm. Mooney move. I, I don't. I wasn't surprised, or I don't think it was out of line that he was the second highest paid uh, as far as guaranteed money uh, free agent wide receiver. So I, I think that that he's a perfect complement to what they already have there. Um, and then you said Houston, and Houston is they're kind of in a, a a checkmate end game. You know, they're not just looking at the AFC South now. They want to get in the mix. Right. Just as a quick aside. Because it's been a little awesome since we talked, so I just want to pick your brain in general, too. What do you think the draft community or the media or even the NFL didn't factor in when scouting C.J. Stroud? What was the missing piece that you think we we saw play out last year? Then you made him that instant hit, and you say players want to play for Houston. They want to play for C.J. Stroud. I think as well as the coaching staff, you know, yeah. I think the coaching staff is very attractive too. And in a way, and this seems like so long ago, but remember when the bills drafted Josh Allen, they also drafted Jermaine Edmonds too, like to kind of quarterback their defense. And mm -hmm. that same thing happened with Will Anderson. Like let's yeah. get a young leader type on each side of the ball. It's amazing to me though. I mean, I thought, and this isn't revisionist history. I thought Stroud was clearly a better prospect than young. And, I'm a bit of an old school scout. You know, we were joking off the air. We've both been doing this a long time and, you know, getting a little set in my ways in yeah. my fifties now. And I held his, you know, young size against him in a big way. But I also, as an old school curmudgeon scout, had a hard time jumping on an Ohio State quarterback. And that sounds so dumb, <laughs> you know, like, sure. but boy, these Ohio State quarterbacks have life easy. And, um, you know, I, I got a little bit caught up in, I even forget what it's called now, the test that you, that Stroud didn't do S2. that. Great. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, no one's talking about this, that this year because it didn't hold up quite as well. I, I didn't think either were great prospects. You know, I, I'll be honest, I like the guys coming out this year better than both at the time. And I, like many, even though he was my number one quarterback, did sell Stroud a little bit short. He's remarkable. Yeah. I What I seized on when reading his story is that he earned everything. He earned mm -hmm. everything in his life. And, he, you know, he came from a very humble background. And at a time when other prospects that he came to be known on, on a very similar level as, you know, they had private coaches and they were going off to this camp and that camp, he was – he was building himself up. Uh, and I wonder if that's part of, you mentioned D'Amico Ryan to love that alignment uh, and getting your signature players uh, and circling back around to the point of how teams show where they think they're at. I really like the, the, the symmetry in basically the trade 
of Daniil Hunter for Jonathan Greenard, right? Mm -hmm. Because Minnesota probably going to move up and take J.J. McCarthy, or at least that's the the vibe right now. They want a a younger player, a four-year contract, spreading that out. Houston, again, they're getting someone to win now. And you mentioned Will Anderson. Uh, That was the instant reaction. And that's an exciting reaction uh, because it isn't just what Hunter brings but it's how Hunter and Anderson can make each other more valuable playing together. Maybe they'll have the premier pass rush duo in the league. Uh, speaking of, of a few other teams that uh, made some so Can I stop you real quick? Because I know talk. sometimes go on ahead. the couch, please, we're, please we're allowed to go on yeah. tangents and all these things. Oh, yes. And I mentioned the Absolutely. nest earlier. And yes, I'm judging quarterbacks differently now. And, and, and Josh Allen, I happen to mention too, a perfect example. I mean, I almost don't care who the player is as much as where he lands, how patient mm-hmm. that team will be with him, and what his ultimate upside is. You know, I mean, like, like to me, those are the three biggest things. Is this guy going to be a big time success or not? Like, Josh Allen was a train wreck when he came out of school in that first year or two. But his upside was immense, and the landing spot was sound, and they were patient with him. You know, we just saw five young, semi-high pedigree guys from Mac Jones to Fields to Pickett to Ritter to Howe all get moved. And I bet if they would have been a little more patient or would have had better landing spots, they would have had a little more success. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, And I think Stroud where two years ago Houston would have been a disaster landing spot, was a perfect soft landing spot for him. And I think they didn't have to be patient with him, but his upside as a passer was his, you know, super trait. I I think that you're right to say when we are evaluating, and you brought this up with Stroud in college, it's really difficult to separate – how much is the how much is it the player? How much is it the surroundings? Right, there was mm-hmm. this discussion about Will Levis last year. Right, his, his well, we changed his offensive coordinator. He was hurt. That's why he was a different quarterback. Drake May, you see some of this discussion around him this year. And like you said, with Stroud, perhaps one of the more difficult things about evaluating him when watching him is how much are we counting it twice uh, if Ohio State's offense make th- makes things easier it doesn't show you everything you need to see um and likewise with some of these quarterbacks because you, know, you mentioned mac jones a pretty bad situation after year one justin fields really terrible yeah. situation right um mm-hmm. you know there are other quarterbacks like zach wilson that maybe we don't need to see we don't need to chalk anything up to the surroundings there but uh, you know that's what's exciting i guess we can get to it since we're to Yinzers here, you know, because it's <laughs> dark Pittsburgh sports, you know, little dark times, clouds on the horizon right now. Um, but it was a really remarkable few days for the Steelers. And you mentioned this too, you know, we can throw Kenny Pickett in there. Kenny Pickett's surroundings, not exactly ideal for growth. Uh, but at the same time, under Mike Tomlin's uh volunteers not hostages ethos, uh, he didn't belong. Um and you're seeing, and this ties into what you're talking about too, with evaluating quarterbacks. You're seeing the league being willing to move on from first-round quarterbacks a lot quicker than we saw in the past. Um, and for the Steelers, you know, one leaves, one comes in. Uh, you know, I had to rub my eyes that the Steelers went from Pickett and Rudolph to Wilson and Fields. Um, how do you see this playing out? Like, are, do we have to revise the old rules about the? Because I would say, hey, the conservative Steelers, it's going to be Russell Wilson, and unless he just face plants. But do you think that they will have a competition for this job? Not so much. Um, I also think those five trades, you know, not all of them were first rounders, but including Ritter and Howe. I think the teams that get the quarterback when we look back on this, we'll be happier or, or got more than their bu- dollars out of them, to be honest mm-hmm. with you. The price was so low. And I do think a lot of those guys just needed to leave the building, sometimes to no fault of their own. I mean, and maybe the locker room still thinks that's their guy. They've been fighting for him. And it's kind of an awkward situation when you're the guy on the billboards and on the, the banners and everyone in the world knows that you're going to be um, – 
replaced, you know, and you got to have to check your ego at the door. So sometimes it's better. This isn't fantasy football. We're not just accumulating all the best quarterbacks we can. As for the Steelers, I think it's pretty clear as we sit here mid-March that Wilson will be the starter. I mean, it would have to be mind-boggling difference in camp preseason, and who even knows if Wilson will play much in the preseason. Uh, They are treating him like a starter, sort of in a Big Ben sort of light, Mm -hmm. you know, that this guy's been around the block, he's got rings, he's got pelts on the wall, et cetera, et cetera. Fields has always looked up to him. I think it's a very interesting dynamic between the two of them personally right now. I also think we should expect some sort of Fields package every Mm -hmm. week. I mean, a Taysom Hill um, plus, you know, he's a better passer than that. I mean, I think he will get his jersey dirty every week. And we know how this goes. I mean, Wilson and Fields both have – everyone's so excited around here, and I I think that's awesome. I am too. I would rather have those two than the three that left. I mean, you totally cleaned the whole position out, including Trubisky. And the upside is immense. But the downside is heavy too. I mean, the Steelers' formula has been if they turn the ball over, they almost always lose. If they win the turnover battle – they almost always win, you know, in a close game, of course, you know, I mean, down to the wire, have to block a punt or something crazy. But these guys make a lot more mistakes than the Steelers quarterbacks have made over the years. You know, I mean, it was really since the end of the, the Ben era, you know, I mean, it was just don't make mistakes. And that only takes you so far. So that's what makes it super exciting. But if Wilson plays like he did really two years ago in Denver, you know everyone on the planet's going to be clamoring for fields like crazy. Right. You, you know, I mean, it could get ugly because there's going to be down moments and the style of quarterback is just so different than it's been. But I think it's Wilson's job. Yeah, I think that what's funny is uh, Steelers fans like myself are saying at least there's a chance, at least when it's the fourth quarter and the team needs a drive to win, there's a chance, whether it's Fields or Wilson. And Bears fans are saying, well, every time Fields takes a snap, there's a chance he's going to make a massively negative play mm-hmm. for the offense. But like you say, the surroundings are different. The expectations are different now. And with Wilson, the expectations and surroundings might be different too. Uh, Nathaniel Hackett. Now I think his ego got a little bruised too. Well, which is good. I, what I've been saying, Matt, is he's coming in as an employee now. Yeah, he's coming yeah, yeah, in yeah. as an employee. Nice. I know Cecil, our mutual friend, my co-host Cecil Lammy, he's going to be down at the owner meeting next week. And oh, I am too. Maybe we, I'll so look him up, look for him because we were talking this morning about what he should ask Mike Tomlin, uh, and he was saying that he might ask him. I forget the name of the team, Russell Wilson's team, and that was obviously a big point of controversy in that first year in Denver. That you know he had coaches, he had people Mm -hmm. in the building literally in the building that weren't working for the broncos and i have to think i know right away sean payne said no to that and i'm curious how mike tom is going to approach that but maybe russell wilson is ready to know i'm not curious at all that's not going to happen here at all yeah yeah yeah, (laughs) exactly exactly but Uh, with mike tomlin always the the reaction there's always information in the way he reacts and things like that too um (laughs) But I, I, and the other thing, uh, a couple other things I, I got to mention about the Steelers of our little Steelers segment here. Um, I do like the clarity in the Patrick Queen move. And there's a mm-hmm. lot of moves this year in free agency showing, I think, showing, and then maybe it's an old canard at this point that teams draft to win their division or they're thinking about winning their division, they're thinking about the matchups within their division. And you see a lot of teams picking up players from within their division. They're the players they have to pre- prepare for twice a year. They're the players that they know uh, frustrate them or otherwise they create admiration watching them. Like the, Bill Belichick always trying to sign the players that were a thorn in his side. But what I really like about this is this has been a sore spot since Ryan Shazier's injury, basically. This has been a spot the Steelers haven't been able to get right. Do you think that Queen represents getting it right? Mostly, yes. And I make this joke all the time on Pittsburgh radio that I hope someday there's a football life or a 30 for 30 with Ozzie Newsome, Harbaugh, Colbert, Tomlin all on a fishing boat or something, mm-hmm. just being honest with each other. Like, I wanted him and you swiped him in the draft right. right before me, or I wanted that guy so bad. And they, they see things through the same lenses, basically. 
And I'm super excited about Queen. I mean, like, I did so much previewing of free agency. I'm like, ah, Queen, he's going to get Tremaine Edmonds money. He's going to get 18 million. Sorry. They got him for much, much less. I mean, just like Fields, when the, when the price was, oh, it's easy to cost a second round pick. I'm like, ah, that doesn't, that's a little rich. But for what they paid for Queen Wilson, who they basically got for free, and Fields, who they basically got for free, I adore what they've done. Now, my concerns are he isn't really a green dot guy. And his spike in play exactly correlated with when they got Roquan it's yeah. for a year and a half. But if you look at it through half full or black and gold color glasses, you could say linebackers, that's usually when they do spike is year three, four. I mean, the early first round picks struggle in this league off the ball linebackers. And Yes, it's great playing next to Roquan, but it's not like Alex Highsmith benefiting from Watt on the other side where they double team one and not the other. They're linebackers. They're in space. I mean, he still does things on his own. So I'm thrilled with it. I don't know that he's a great communicator from what I understand in terms of green dot stuff, but Minka will handle that or one of the other linebackers will handle that. And you nailed it. I mean, they've been looking for Shazier's replacement, which... No GM could have accounted for at the time, but it's been a long time now for quite a while. And I think they found it. Yeah, I think so, too. Well, and we'll see the Ravens. They always have someone coming up the pipeline. Mm-hmm. They've got Trenton Simpson. Um, and you mentioned that about off-ball linebackers. You know, Even Jack Campbell, who oh, yeah. the Lions had handpicked, basically. Uh, they brought him along slowly. So uh, last Steelers point. Deontay Johnson, okay. uh, do you think in time we'll look back at this as yet another, hey, when the Steelers decide it's time to move on from a wide receiver, it's time for all of us to move on from that wide receiver? Or is this one of those situations where maybe it was just not a good personality fit or things went south and they were irreparable, but in a new surrounding, Deontay Johnson can show why the Steelers wanted to sign him to that second contract to begin with? There's a lot here, and I firmly believe that there is one more big Steeler move coming before the draft, and it's going to be for a wide receiver. Mike Williams. uh, Mike Williams is coming to town the day that this, I think, is going to go live. I mean, and I have some sneaking suspicions. They've been on the phone with the Niners about Ayuk or the Bills about Diggs. I mean, I think there's going to be a big shoe that drops at receiver before the draft. So... That being in the works, I think they looked at Deontay and thought, we're not going to give him a contract at the end of the year. But boy, he's such a good hard worker. I mean, he's like the last guy on the practice field. He's a really good route runner. I think he's an underrated asset. But some of his effort stuff wasn't great. You know that in the Arthur Smith offense, and this should be down the line, but he's not going to block. You know, they want some physical guys to help spring long runs. And I think he and others, to be honest with you, got very weary on that side of the ball during the Matt Canada era. era. And it's pretty easy to understand why. And I think it is a hostage prisoner situation there. And this seems strange. And it didn't when they made that deal with the Panthers. I'm like, man, they didn't get enough for the for, for Deontay at all. But maybe they're right. Maybe they're not. But Dante Jackson is someone they love. Uh, they've been trying to get this guy forever. And okay. I mean, if you get a starting corner out of the mix, I kind of looked at him like maybe he's a throw in. They're going to cut him, but they renegotiated his deal. They have very high hopes for Dante Jackson. They've been trying to get him for two or three years. Yeah. And he, now with Joey Porter, they have a number one corner mm-hmm. and maybe Dante Jackson is a speed. Number two corner looks better. We'll see. Their secondary was so slow last year. Cease. Yeah. Or, or I called you Cease. I'm sorry, Sig. Yeah. We were just talking yeah. about Cease. So yeah. Came up with, yeah. It, it, it was a problem. Um, yeah. So, again, at least you're seeing responsiveness. I mean, sometimes in free agency, you at least want to see that a team is accurately self-scouting of where they need to improve, what mm-hmm. they need to add. Um, sp- going Circling all the way back to one of the teams you mentioned, I want to go back and, and, and drill down a little bit more about um, the cousin signing in Atlanta. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because we, we're going to find out just how much the quarterback play was holding back this Atlanta team. Uh, how good of a job Terry Fontenot did with 
assistance from Arthur Smith. Speaking of the Steelers, yeah, I was saying we'll bring up pieces. Arthur Smith here too. Because yeah. you mentioned building a nest, I love that. I'm going to totally steal that. By the way, I'll give oh, you credit you every time I use it. Um, because you, you know, we can look at say a Justin Fields and say, well, they, they really didn't start building him a nest until because another. Uh, speaking of ornithology, um, I've always used the term imprinting. Imprinting is like the 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 bird that the baby bird that thought it was a human because it, it was raised by a human, right? So that er, those early impressions imprint, and I think the David Carr, right? The worse the situation a quarterback is dropped into, the more psychologically they'll never recover from it, and they'll never really be able to overcome that. And I think that when you say that the Bears have built a nest, uh, now you see the nest that was built for well, whatever quarterback Atlanta was going to get, except it's not a young quarterback. It's Kirk Cousins. Um, you know, and we can talk, hey, we're talking fantasy football. It's always in the background, mm-hmm. right? But, you know, this is potentially, I think, the biggest delta f- from what we saw in 20. 20- you add in Zach Robinson too. So it's not just Kirk Cousins. It's Kirk Cousins and Zach Robinson. And otherwise a team that on both sides of the ball pretty much had all the pieces in place. Uh, you know, do you is this a situation like the kind of leap say Detroit made in their second year, uh, a surprising leap, or do you think that maybe Atlanta and some of this kind of talk is overrating Cousins' ability to really take a team up to the next level? It's a great conversation, and it's funny you mentioned the bird imprinting. We we have a bird. We have Larry the Bird. Uh-huh. And Larry Bird, obviously. Sure. And he, he imprinted on my son uh-huh. you know, like 10 years ago. Well, now my son's a 17-year-old goofball, you know, and isn't as into the bird as he was when he was 10, and so he screams from Michael all the time. But anyway, <laughs> that definitely happens, you know. So yeah. <laughs> they're, they're, they're buddies. I mean, he, he went, I'm the only one that feeds a bird, and he wants to bite the skin off my bones. I mean, <laughs> but Mike can do anything he wants, my son. Anyway, so <laughs> real quick on Arthur Smith. I don't think Arthur Smith was a good head coach at all, but boy, have I dug into him as a coordinator since the Steelers joined him. And I guarantee he's going – I would have liked Kirk Cousins. I mean, right. I, I do defend Smith a little bit more than I should because of the black and gold homerism. I will not deny that. But he had the least accurate quarterbacks in the league. I mean, how many times was Kyle Pitts wide open and he threw it in the seats? Mariota can't complete passes anymore. End of career Ryan. Um, the guys from last year were well below the line just in completing easy passes. So Cousins just bringing that to the table along with leadership goes a very long way. And I think the defense took a great stride forward last year after being horrendous. They're in a position now, maybe they'll take the first defensive player off the board in the draft or trade down and still get somebody of that ilk, a corner, a D lineman, whatever. And I also like that they added team speed. They they don't need all Hakeem and Ralph Sampson out there. Let's give me some little guys that can, you know, handle the ball. Give me a spud web that can go to the hoop or Muggsy Bogues, you know, so they added those guys. They already have the line. I think Bijan's a superstar. However, I say this every, 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 every year. I mean, especially once the draft hits, this is the time in the NFL of eternal optimism. And the NFL is so smart for structuring their calendar this way. Every team's going to be, oh, we're going to be healthier than we were right. last year. Oh, that guy's coming back from injury. He'll be fine. Kirk Cousins is, what, 38 coming off a massive injury. Like, this is a little more dangerous than you think. I mean, you always think of Cousins being the safe option. Well, I don't know that that's true right now. Yeah, there's some chickens that haven't hatched that were counting. Yeah, yeah, Um, yeah. Absolutely. And I'd like now a a second reference to, I mean, as fans or as fantasy football players, when you watch certain offenses, you feel a sense of, of being discouraged or being demoralized and a lack of hope. And that also affects the players you mentioned it in Atlanta you mentioned it in Pittsburgh I think that's something that you know sometimes with these moves Cousins Fields Wilson it's even just the possibility of something that then can actually help create something different Mm -hmm. because there's hope for something different but like you said we get ahead of ourselves I'd love that you mentioned Hakeem and Ralph Sampson by the way because it's March (laughs) 
it's March, right? And being the age we are, you know, we can remember watching Ralph Sampson in the NCAA That's the last tournament. time I knew anything about basketball. Right? I mean, <laughs> Pittsburgh doesn't have a team. I don't know anything. Well, maybe you're talking about the Rockets because they did play together on the Rockets, didn't they? That's they what I was talking the, about. The Rockets. Yeah, the I mean, Twin I, Towers. That's right. That's when I, I was a um, teenager remembering. Yeah, I'm yeah. thinking uh, March Madness. But yeah, uh, <laughs> uh, and, and uh, absolutely adding that speed. I mean, there are probably a few teams. I, I guess because it never hurts. We're talking about this in terms of being yins or homers. Can we just take a moment to to point and laugh like Nelson Munt style? Ha ha at <laughs> Dallas because that's a team that isn't creating any hope. What do you think happened here with Dallas in this cycle? Well, I think there's a couple things that have been true about Dallas for a while now. Is they draft better than people think. I mean, they they do a very good job year after year in the draft, which I think is. Some luck involved. I mean, I think if we all have made a thousand draft picks, some would be better than others, but some wouldn't be 70% better than others, whatever. You know, that's a whole different story. I have been told that Jerry's a little more interested in the bottom line than he is truly putting himself out to win the title, you know, at this stage of his career, that he's really happy with his stage of life, just being extremely wealthy. But I don't know that that's 100% true. You'd love to see Dallas do more. And last year they did. They went out and got Cooks and Gilmore and made some nice moves outside the organization. But I'm going to give them a little bit of a pass just because I think they're trying to figure out, just like your Tampa conversation, how do I pay Dak, Lamb, and Parsons? You know, like, I don't want any of those guys to go, how can I make those huge Jenga pieces, you know, foundational guys for me? Yeah, and with Prescott, I guess they did finally make a move to get a little bit of cap relief. Interesting timing for that. Um, but it seems like we're on a rerun here of whenever they tagged him twice and ended up having to pay a lot more than if they would have just paid him before giving him the first tag at the rate. Because that's another thing. If you like caponomics and you like that side of a football franchise, management a lot of that gets implicated in free agency and it seems like what is his cap number matt like 55 60 million something like that yeah i'm not exactly sure after the restructure but that's what we were it's, shooting it was for. high and high. It, it, it seemed like the very assuming that you you say hey dak prescott's going to retire a cowboy and i haven't seen anything that makes me think that shouldn't be the case Mm-mm. why wouldn't you have gotten that number down before free agency but i know at least i can't remember who it was that reported like a national reporter said well jerry still wants him to prove again that he's worth the next installment of his contract and i just you know i think at this point you have every you have the you have the eagles let's talk about the eagles that's a good transition because you have the eagles let me do one quick dallas thing if you don't mind so i think being the quarterback of the dallas cowboys is sort of like being the center fielder of the yankees too you know like is he aikman is he staubach no but He's in top 10 quarterback all day long, and I know he hasn't won in the playoffs, and Lamar's even dealing with some of this. Can they win the big one? I don't buy that at all. There was a, a large portion of the season where Dak Prescott would have been first or second on my MVP vote yeah. this year. You know, I mean, he was tremendous for much of the year, and I don't think he's a choker or anything like that. You know, like Herbert and Lamar and some of these guys, you hear that about, I'm like, ah, I'm not buying that. Winning a playoff game is a lot harder than you think. But the other trend I wanted to mention I forgot earlier is the Mm -hmm. Cowboys do sure seem to reward their own too much. I mean, Mm -hmm. they give too big a contracts to their own. So let's talk Eagles. I'm cool with that, too. No, yeah. yeah, So, you know, it's funny how Kellen Moore, this is like we're playing like six degrees of Kellen Moore, right? Because, you know, coming out of last year's offseason, we thought, well, how much was Kellen Moore responsible for what was good about the Cowboys offense? And now mm-hmm. it's, we're running back McCarthy and Schottenheimer, really. And Kellen Moore, you mentioned Justin Herbert. Kellen Moore is going to be with Justin Herbert. He's finally getting somebody who's going to maximize his talent. Well, that didn't come about. And now Kellen Moore is uh, in Philadelphia. Um, Saquon Barkley, you know, this is one of those good situations to discuss the idea that we get an idea of GMs. We get an idea of their style. We get an idea of what they value and what they don't value. And certainly nobody had Howie Roseman breaking the bank on a running back on their bingo card uh, until he did it. Uh, do you think that he picked his moment? Or do you think that we're going to remember why that was the smart way to go about it? Don't pay running backs on second, third contracts. Well, 
it's a little bit like the Patrick Queen conversation. You know, I game plan against this guy twice a year, and I don't like doing that because he's a pain in the butt to play against. So mm-hmm. I'd rather play with him than against him. I think we might see less tush pushing without Kelsey and a new offensive coordinator. Mm-hmm. That's somewhat of a fantasy nugget for Saquon in terms of getting in the end zone. I didn't see this coming. I mean, they're like the most analytically driven team in the league, and they're paying a running back. Not McCaffrey money, but, I mean, they, it was a major priority for them to go get this guy at a premium price. And I mentioned McCaffrey because I think that they – my hunch is they will treat him like a McCaffrey role receiver first 13 carries a game, not Derrick Henry plow him in the line over and over and over. Let's extend his career, treat him like a weapon, almost like the Jameer Gibbs – conversation of, oh, they should have taken him in the middle of the first round. Well, he's not a typical running back. He's not Najee Harris. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And I think that what's exciting is we've not seen Saquon Barkley in a functional offense with a functional quarterback right. and, a, right, right. and a very good offensive line. The way that the Eagles draft on offensive line, it's almost sickening, really, especially as a Steelers fan. Because you know some of these guys, like uh, Landon Dickerson, I would he would look better in a Steeler uniform than Najee Harris. But like we can't, we're not going to have the opportunity <laughs> to see how that, that was the name that you know. We'll, we'll see uh, uh, th- this year. We'll see what the Steelers can do. Although they don't always hit. Andre Dillard obviously didn't hit, but they right. do so. They well. take a lot of bites of that apple. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and they get like a Jordan Mailata in the near the end of the draft. So it all balances out. But, you know, it's exciting to see what Barkley's going to do. It's exciting from the perspective of the Eagles coming off of a down year that just got worse as the season went on, not standing pat and saying we have to ch- we have to change the formula. We have to do something different. That definitely does that. Okay, we're talking running backs now. Let's do – let's do – let's go ahead. It, it seemed like the Eagles came into that Tampa playoff game like – we already know we're going to lose. Yeah. The over, you know, and so we're going to get two new coordinators. We're going to change how we do business. Maybe we'll spend a draft pick on a linebacker or safety and try to take away the middle of the field more. And I, I think they're a very smart organization. Yeah. And again, the self scouting, uh, mm-hmm. really being able to see where the critical points of failure were and, and addressing them. Uh, and, and like you said, um, Last year, this team was basically a dead team walking. Let's talk running backs, because I think maybe one of the most shocking, speaking of analytics, one of the most shocking developments in free agency this year was so many teams prioritized their running back move. That was what they wanted to get done first. And we'll just step through these. You can just react. We, We can go back to the old, like, you know, cold, cool, lukewarm, warm, hot how you feel about the move as we go through these running backs. Um, Let's start out with the easiest one. I think Derrick Henry in Baltimore. I adore this move because I've been thinking he's going to break down for years and I'm kind of done like Adrian Peterson. I mean, he's a cyborg. He's different than everybody else that I, I think he's, he had the worst blocking in the league and he still created so many yards after contact last year. It was tremendous real quick. Sig. I mean, just as big picture, free agent stuff, you know, we opened the show talking about the Mac Joneses and Fields, you know, how little they got in return. I thought that was a theme. Yeah. The running back stuff, I think, is a theme, but I also think it's coupled with how much guards and centers are making, yeah. too, because I think the league is zagging. I mean, if they and the Rams is a perfect example. Is If you're going to live in too high and live in nickel and dime, I'm going to pay guards that are 340 pounds and give the ball to Derrick Henry and mash your face in because yeah. there's no nose tackles in the world. There's no LeVon Kirkland's in the world anymore. You know, so I think that was a theme of the off season too. I say this all the time. And you said it earlier. I love this time of year and I love the draft even more than the regular season. Cause it's the only time teams don't lie. You, they, you know, you always talk about reading the tea leaves. I steal that one from you all the time. You can have the nest all you want. So if you're smart about it, you can really see their poker hands this time of year. And I think the league is telling us this running back class isn't very good. Quarterbacks get hurt at a record rate. There's between 60 and 69 quarterbacks and that are getting starts year after year. So we're going to run the ball against light defenses. And that makes all the sense in the world. Yeah, I think that. Um, the guard talk, I mentioned Landon Dickerson, became the highest paid guard in mm-hmm. NFL history. 
He wasn't even a free yeah. agent. Uh, and you saw the Kevin Dotson deal. That was before free agency. That was another precursor. What happened was it really just as simple as the Steelers playing Dotson out of position because you know he was a Steelers guy. How did how did they blow this? Ugh. I don't know. I, I I will say he was very mistake prone from a mental side of things. Here, I'm not saying he's dumb or anything like that. But if someone jumped off sides, it was him. If someone mm -hmm. didn't see a blitz coming, it was him. And I don't think that's a right-left thing. I do think the scheme in L.A. helped him. And good for him. You know, hey, I hope Kenny Pickett turns into a pro bowler, too. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, I, I don't hold grudges that, hey, you didn't, you know, develop them right. But, boy, what a steal for the Rams. Yeah. And then they, and they get Jonah Jackson. Although, uh, so the Rams, you, know, yeah. you see, again, what are the Rams doing? Investing heavy at guard. And we, we can tip the uh, cap here to Dan Morgan. I don't know who had Dan Morgan becoming a GM, uh, you know, a few years ago. Yeah, but true. he goes out and gets Damian Lewis and a punt, a, a, a road grader. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, I heard some talk of aligning that with uh, what the Saints did with Drew Brees. When you have a, a short quarterback. Exactly. The guards and center become more important, pocket integrity and field vision and things like that. So you're right. Uh, the guard, I look at it almost, Matt, like it's a positionally they're haves and have nots, right? Um, you know, running back have not as a have not position, off ball linebacker, you mentioned, you know, Patrick Queen, Saquon Barkley, these are among the very best options at their position and they were $13 million mm -hmm. a year. The same as Darnell Mooney, you know, wide receiver, a half position, cornerback, a half position, obviously offensive tackle. But now I, I think you have it across the whole offensive line. But let's go back to the have not position of running back and just and, and the Derrick Henry thing. It, you mentioned the mirror, like the Spider-Man meme, the Steelers and the, and the Ravens. Like if we weren't Steelers fans, we would naturally be Ravens fans because of how similar <laughs> the teams are. And and what a dream, really. I mean, Derrick Henry and uh, Lamar Jackson and how maybe they can be multipliers for each other. Let's, let's touch on some of these others. The first move of free agency, DeAndre Swift to the bears. This seems a little crazy to me. I mean, I, I think it's a great yeah. example of building the nest for the soft landing for the quarterback. And I often will say, I, I give teams that are bringing in a new quarterback or a super young quarterback, a little bit more benefit of the doubt when they spend on running backs. Cause I think that's a good whoopee. There's a Mr. Mom reference mm -hmm. for you uh, for, for your young quarterback to have Saquon behind you or McCaffrey behind you or something along those lines. I just think several teams now have told us that they can live without Swift. You know I mean? I think he's a right. good player. I just don't think he's super reliable. Um, I, I think he's fine, but this looks like an overpay to me. Yeah. It's like Miles Sanders last year. basically. Exactly. Yeah. Lots of traits. Lots of could be's or what ifs that you, mm -hmm. you know for the whole career you're going to keep asking that. Uh, I can we can throw Calvin Ridley in with Tony Pollard. You know, this is interesting. It, uh, in the wake of Derrick Henry, uh, the, the Titans, Brian Callahan showing us, okay, we're going to go out, we're going to get Calvin Ridley, we're going to break the bank for him, sneak in there as the Jags are trying to avoid paying a second round pick instead of a third round pick, and then they go right away. They go out and get Tony Pollard, who seems like uh, interchangeable. With Ty J Spears, mm -hmm. uh, uh, did you like that move? And what do you think about the general picture of what the Titans are going to show us in the first year under Callahan? Again, building a Levis nest. You know, I mean, they're mm -hmm. uh, my favorite thing about the Callahan hire is Daddy came with them. <laughs> you know, the coach up <laughs> the line. Yeah. yeah, and they go get Cushenberry. I bet they end up with Alt or somebody like that. It was a dreadful offensive line. So. I think it's pretty clear that Mike Vrabel is not in charge anymore. I mean, they look at things through much different eyes organizationally. I don't think they would have spent on Pollard if Vrabel was there. They would have it would be a big two hundred and forty pound back. I mean, I don't think it would be a, a slasher that way. I, I thought Ridley was a major overpay. I mean, yeah. I thought he was an eighteen, nineteen million dollar guy that was probably better than his numbers indicated with Jacksonville, but isn't a tier one player. Good player, older than you think, you know, but I kind of get it. I mean, sort of like the Patriots and what I expect the Patriots to do in draft is they're concentrating in a, and the, the Panthers are another one concentrating an entire offseason on offense around really young quarterbacks. So I condone that move. But in a nutshell, 
I think Pollard was probably a little more expensive than I like and very much hurt Spears. Um, Ridley is definitely more expensive than I want. And for fantasy reasons, I might not own any Titans at their going rate. Yeah, I think that's probably wise uh, because I don't think this is going to be a big pie to split up and you have a lot of slices to split up. And it, the one, I, I get it. I got some pushback and I said, well, if Levis isn't good, the Ridley money is wasted basically and like you're saying right, you're yeah. building a nest for him well how do you find out if he's good unless you put talent around him but i feel like what is really like 29 by the time you if it's not levis i don't think it's levis then by not the time either. you do get a quarterback he's already not on the team i mean you're already into the not very team friendly years of that contract yeah. where ridley might be in decline but he gotta try something after uh the derrick henry era and it's so uh disappointingly for the titans you know they were a number one seed one of those years they had a massive upset of the ravens one of those years um this i think this was a sneaky good move and we're back to the Bengals are a shrewd smart organization but this yeah when did that start loss, well right. they had it with andy dalton <laughs> i was pointing out during the andy dalton era they were also a very shrewd organization they were constantly re-signing their own talent to under market deals they were making good draft picks they were uh, drafting with two years in the future in mind and they're back to that but i i thought this zach moss move uh was really really shrewd not just for the money uh but for how little uh wear and tear there is on this guy four years in are you optimistic about moss or do you think it's even just simple because then like, we'll put the fantasy spin on it because i see people saying are you in on zach moss or chase brown and my answer is is this a trick question <laughs> so the Bengals, I mean, I'm sure you remember, it sure felt like when we were kids watching the draft that they would just, they were that dude in your fantasy league that picks up a magazine right. and, and, you know, and just picked whoever and didn't care about character or did any homework. They had one scout or no scouts at one point. But no, quietly, they have, you know, everyone around here, oh, the Bengals are so cheap. No, I think they're shrewd. I think they're pretty smart now. And Landing Burrow makes things a little softer as well. I mean, that worked out quite well for them. But I have a lot more respect for the organization top to bottom. I don't have a strong take on the running backs. I like what they got out of Moss, and I thought he showed very, very well last year. I didn't understand why the Bills didn't like him more. He seems like a great back for the Tundra and Buffalo. I mean, more so than James Cook or some of the smaller guys. I think the Bills have made that mistake year after year that they – they need Jerome Bettis. They need Mike Allstott up there, and they, and they keep going for scat backs. But I took I took the Moss move as we really like Chase Brown. Yeah, well, I think that they, unlike Spears and Pollard, you can see Moss and Brown complementing each other. No you doubt. can see Moss and Brown each bring something the other one doesn't. But I do think that Moss is showed last year. I, I don't know if folks realize there was a point early on in the season that Moss was, if he wasn't leading the league in rushing, he was very close. Yeah. And even when Jonathan Taylor first came back, Moss played like a player that you don't just push aside for Jonathan Taylor. He was he had that good. I don't know what happened in Buffalo. I don't know if it was injuries. I don't know why, because obviously Buffalo liked him enough to spend a third round pick on him. Uh, it just never came about. And this might just be a delayed impact for Moss. And uh, it, it's it, maybe it was be a protection see... thing or something like that, you know? Yeah, um, and, and you mentioned um, Mixon. I don't know what, you know, there's that one asterisk on Houston's offseason was giving it Mixon that extension, but that's okay. They like mm -hmm. Mixon. Um, I, there's one other running back I want to ask you about, not a running back that changed teams, but a running back who's going to get an opportunity. Zamir White. I know there was that great clip about him mm -hmm. talking about how he's country strong and what his, his routine is. Uh, it seems like with Al Alexander Madison, probably the only addition the Raiders are going to make that Zamir White's going to get a chance to carry over what he did in December last year. Do you think he can do it? Pretty much. Yeah. I mean, real quick, I think Mixon's pretty shot to be honest with yeah. you. You mentioned him too. I, I don't, that's the one I didn't get with Houston, but maybe he's an upgrade, but I think he's pretty shot. I think the best news you could have, like if you're in a dynasty league and you own Zamir White is them signing Madison, right? Because now they're probably done. They have so many defensive needs, right side of the O line needs quarterback need probably that I can't even imagine them drafting one at all, or certainly not on the first two days. So I'll do battle with Madison if I'm Zamir White, and I think he comes out on the other end as the lead dog. Now, 
there is something to putting stringing seasons together and being durable at that position and Emmett Smith playing with his shoulder out of whack. And, you know, it, does, does White have those type of qualities? I don't know that he needs to for the fantasy world. I mean, I think he's going to be a top 24 running back in the fantasy world, right? Yeah. I, yeah. Just, just by the blueprint of the team, I think. Yeah and, yeah. and Antonio Pierce will have them hanging around in games. They're not going to get blown out. He's going to be hanging around. Um, one last second wave of free agency move before we go off the rails and we'll talk, you know, just whatever comes into our brains. Um, not a lot of buzz. And certainly there was a time that you would have thought when Marquise Brown hits free agency, he's going to get paid. He's going to get mm-hmm. paid. He's got speed. He could take the top off of defense. He's been reasonably productive. Um, he didn't do anything to show that it was a horrible mistake for him to go in the first round. Uh, whenever Baltimore took him, but he gets uh, basically a D, not even what DJ Chark got two years ago, a prove it deal with Kansas City. But again, for fantasy, this could be a really intriguing spot now that uh, uh, Pittsburgh product Sky Moore isn't working out. Um, mm-hmm. What did you think when you saw the patient Chiefs land Marquise Brown after the first wave of free agency? Yeah, I thought that he's a noticeably better version of Valdez, Scantling, or Hardman. He's not the next coming of Tyreek. You know, there's a big gap between those guys and Tyreek. And I think he's some right in the middle. You know I mean? I don't think he's going to replace Tyreek by any stretch. I think Rice is running a lot of Kelsey routes, to be honest with you. I mean, he's the short intermediate guy. So the -the over-the-top guy makes tons of sense. It wouldn't shock me if Brown took a little less to play for that team, as every team should or every player should consider, because they are now the dynasty in the league. And you might end up with a ring, and he might end up doubling that salary a year from now. I thought it was a fabulous move. Um, I also think this is kind of true with the draft class not being great at guard, not being great at running back. It's so great at receiver yet again that if you're not an upper tier guy it's not a great year to be out on the market. I think he was a good example of that, but in the fantasy world, I probably have him outside my top 36. I have not done any kind of fantasy or anything like that. Yeah. I mean, he he could be on my team, but I bet he gets overdrafted. Yeah. I mean, it just depends on how many targets he gets uh, and Mm -hmm. how much he revives the downfield passing, which seemed to kind of wither on the vine last year for Patrick Mahomes. Okay. Turning the page, because uh, off the rails, uh, and we've alluded to it a few times, because you know, we've been around these parts a while, and we're talking about Ralph Sampson, the kids looking <laughs> up, who's Ralph Sampson? You know, you, you and I uh, grew up uh, not very far from each other, but there was probably a time that we were both at South South Hills Village at the same time, or something like that, oh, right? We probably like walked I think right my daughter's there. there right now, to be honest. Right, right. Um, <laughs> and I've, I find myself saying a lot more lately, Matt, I mean, it's a it's really a, a privilege, a gift even, to have lived long enough to see things change, like really change during our lifetimes. When mm-hmm. I say that, what's something, and it can be football-related or totally not football-related, but what's something that you look at and you say, yeah, wow, in the time that I've been alive, this has really changed? I'll probably keep it football-related, yeah. but I mean, I'm going to go the opposite direction real quick. I mean... People don't realize this. I'm 51 years old. I was born in 1973, and which was about when the Steelers got big, of course. Sure. You know, like, you know, the, it, it, and I've still seen three head coaches in my life. Yeah. 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 <laughs> You're talking about not changing. You know, I mean, I'm 51, and Chuck Noll was hired well before I was born. Right. And there's only been three, and it doesn't look like there's going to be any changes soon. Um, you know, what's kind of interesting though, just kind of looking at you know me being a kid in our era versus some of the younger pups out there is I think trades in the NFL are happening so much more. And my theory on it is, I think you had something to do with that. I think the fantasy, I mean, sure. these GMs nowadays played Madden where you could just build a team, no matter what they played fantasy. I mean, I'm going to make a trade left and right with my buddies at school. They grew up with internet of course and social Mm -hmm. media the world's just so much smaller that uh, back in the day i think teams were just afraid to make trades they didn't know about injuries or you know this is a way you could do things you got to keep grinding and do the exact same thing but i think a big reason the gms nowadays trade more is because they grew up listening to you and you know doing fantasy stuff and playing madden 
yeah, it, it, it's funny because people would always say it's not fantasy football. But we're in this part of the calendar, it kind of is fantasy football because we're talking mm-hmm. about a nebulous commodity. These players represent, you know, this potential amount of production for this cost or this many years of cost control or something like that. I, I, I do think, do you think that the NFL has overall, because there are good organizations and bad organizations. Do you think that the NFL has gotten smarter in the time that you've been covering it? Yes. I very much believe there are good organizations and bad organizations too. I mean, not that like the Jags, I'm not picking on Jacksonville, oh. but the, I mean, we just had a week's worth of free agency go by. And I seem like I make this joke every year that in about, oh, 355 days from now, they're going to be cutting the guys they signed two years ago so they can sign guys this year that they're going to cut two years from now. And, you know, like a lot of teams make the same mistakes over and over. Um, is it gotten smarter? absolutely X's and O's scheme wise times a thousand analytically times a thousand. But I think there's a lot of organizations that have been doing it the way they do it. And, you know, I mean, people don't look at these organizations like 32 different companies. They're right. 32 different companies, you know, IBM and Apple didn't do things the same way, you know I mean? From the top down. And I think a lot of them, but what's different is, even if your opponent's way better than you, I'm still going to make a fortune. You know, like there's no reason from ownership down to change what you're doing because you're going to win no matter what financially. Yeah, that's fair. There's not a lot of pressure. This is why it's sad to be a Pirates fan. You know, there's not a right. lot of pressure to um, to win whenever the success financially of the enterprise isn't really tied Guaranteed. to winning. Yeah. And yeah, it can get frustrating. Um, but I, and I think you're right that the X's and O's I mean, thing. You could be Snyder in Washington and be the worst owner you possibly right. could and make billions by right. selling the team a couple of years later, by doing the worst job you possibly could do. Right. David Tepper, who seems yeah, to have right. his fingerprints on every bad move that the Panthers are making, is probably still watching mm-hmm. his investment in the Panthers appreciate while he's ruining right. it. Unlike uh, other situations, um, and I do think I'll, I'll I, one last quick note I'll end on, um, and I want to call out the Packers here. And I've said this a couple of times on my show, but I thought it was such an interesting thing because you brought up the S two, uh, the S two test. Um, yes. And I saw that the Packers said that they do pay attention to the S two processing test results, not to weed players out or filter their draft board, but so that when they do draft a player, they all know how they can best support him. Ah, I like that. And I like that. And I, I think that is one way I think that maybe organizations NFL is getting smarter, kinder, of gentler NFL, where you're meeting players where they're at. Instead mm-hmm. of saying, this is our program, you're either going to get with the program or you're not going to get with the program. And, uh, you know, so we'll you're see. You're dead on. Yeah. The Packers. I, I like that quite a bit. Yeah. I, I, I think that's something that the, the whole league and all of us really in our lives, especially you talk about parenting, especially as parents, uh, mm-hmm. the, the ultimate challenge. Um, but uh, we all continue to get smarter. We all know Matt Williamson's work, and it's always a pleasure, a joy to get to hang out with him, to get to hang out with you all. Even though football's five, six months away, we're excited because the NFL gives us reasons to get excited. You give us reasons to be excited because you're so classy. 